Eons ago, uh, I was a hotshot tennis player. Uh, I played at the highest levels. Um, I was the NC2A singles champion, doubles champion, team champion. I um, played on the tennis circuit for eight years. I was doubles partner with Arthur Ashe. And I was also his lawyer at the time that Open Tennis was born. And I helped him figure out what to do about all of that. So I've had a front row seat at the evolution of tennis for all the, this period of time. And uh, tennis has changed dramatically in many, many ways from the way it was when I was playing, so much so that I really don't even recognize it. I'll just give you two quick examples. One is money. When I was playing, we got room and board and a little white envelope with some cash in it under the table. Uh, I got 50 pounds sterling when I played Wimbledon, which was equal to $120 US, just enough to get a uh, bed and breakfast at Earl's Court. Uh, today, they, they drive up a, a Brinks truck and they throw bags of money down at the feet of the tennis players. Um, then there is the equipment. Uh, I brought with me uh, the type of racket that I used to use, which is, to me, a thing of beauty, a, a thing of art. It's laminated, mahogany color. Uh, today, they use bionic equipment made out of space materials. And with this particular racket, or one that looked just like it, uh, I beat Arthur Ashe four out of four times in singles tournaments. That was before he won Wimbledon, before he won the US championship, before he won the Australian championships. And I ran into him after he had done that, and he put his finger on my chest and he said, Larry, I've never beaten you. Let's go out right now and play for $10,000. I laughed. I said, Arthur, you had your chance. That chance is gone, and it's never going to return. So you might say I actually won the fifth match by declining to play. Now, I could spend this entire talk talking to you about how tennis has evolved in so many different ways, or about the birth of open tennis, or about Arthur. Uh, I do want to spend one minute talking about Arthur because he's, he was such a special human being. He had so much class. I'll only tell you this. Uh, um, I had a chance to room with him. I had a chance to travel with him. I had a chance to play with him. Uh, when we were playing, uh, we debated social issues. And um, in my opinion, the loss of Arthur was an unbelievable loss, not only to tennis and to the United States, but really to the world. I mean, I could not believe when I was playing with him that he was actually as good a human being as he actually was. Because I knew that tennis players as a whole, myself included, were basically assholes. <laughs> and I couldn't understand how he could be the way he was. But he really was. But those, those things were long ago. And that's not why I'm here. I'm here because uh, there's something that I want to share with everybody that, for me, has been extremely valuable and I think could be valuable to a lot of people. Hopefully, it'll be interesting. Hopefully, some of you will get something out of it and, and have some value. And if you do, I'll be very happy with the result of this. And, and I, t I mentioned to you that tennis has changed dramatically in every way except one. And this is the way in which it hasn't changed. Tennis, in my view, is really a metaphor for life. When you play a tennis match, even though it lasts an hour and a half or two hours or three hours, depending upon your skill level and, and, and your enthusiasm, um, you're really living a full life in miniature. And don't be fooled by the fact that it would only take that amount of time. Because when you are playing tennis, 
you're not just hitting tennis balls and playing tennis. So let's take a much deeper look at it. When you're playing tennis, you are problem solving. You're dealing with what you have to deal with. You're learning to deal with stress because stress is put upon you constantly. You are learning the importance of endurance. You're learning the importance of focusing on doing your personal best instead of just thinking about winning a match. Because if you think about winning a match, you aren't going to win a match. When you're playing tennis, you're learning to control your mind. You're learning to be unflinchingly honest with yourself. Because if you're not, you can't progress. You're learning to lose. You're learning what to do when you lose. A very, very important thing in this life. Now, there is this magical 30 seconds between the time that one point ends and another point begins. And a lot of players and a lot of people at every level, pros and, and amateurs, waste that 30 seconds. They think about how badly their forehand is or how terribly they're playing or there is a good looking girl that's walking around the corner, but they're not focusing on what do they have to do to make things better for themselves. And in tennis, you have to make these decisions as to what to do in 30 seconds. In life, of course, you don't, you're not constricted in such ways. But the, there are junctures. There's junctures in a match. There's junctures in life. And, and in life, you know, the important decisions, when you come to a corner and you're going to go this way or that way, if it's going to be who you're going to marry, what job you're going to take, where you're going to live, that decision is going to last for you for years, often decades. And it doesn't always work out for you. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be receptive to understanding that if things aren't working for you, how are you going to change? Um, you know, when you're playing tennis, you can actually look into the soul of your opponent. Because the way they act under pressure in a tennis match is exactly the way they're going to act under pressure in life. I've seen it a thousand times. People try to hide from it, but eventually they can't. And their true nature comes out. And if you're aware of that and you understand that this is happening, it can help you. Um, you know, the difference between the best players all of them are physically gifted. But it's the mind. It's the persons that can use those 30 seconds to figure out what to do. Um, let me share with you some ways in which I have used this outside of tennis, because you, you understand exactly how I have used it in tennis, because I've explained it to you. When I went to UCLA and I was playing there, uh, I also was a walk-on in John Wooden's basketball program. And after a year and a half of being in the program, I thought to myself, well, I could end up being very mediocre in both sports. What am I going to do about this? So I went to Coach Wooden, and I discussed it with him. And he said, Larry, you're on the team. You're not going to start. But if you play, you're going to have to give it everything that you have. And if you don't play, I'm going to support you. So you make the decision. So I made the decision to drop basketball after a year and a half and put my efforts in tennis. And two things happened. Number one is that particular year, I did not lose a single tournament match. I was the intercollegiate tennis player of the year ended up in the Intercollegiate Tennis Hall of Fame. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for having made that decision. And I didn't really lose everything with Coach Wooden because he sort of adopted me. He was a tennis fanatic. And he adopted me, and, and I brought my dad over, and we had meals together. And I brought my son over, and we had meals together. And he was a lifelong friend of mine. Another way in which I used what I learned on the tennis court 
was when I was 34, my doubles partner at UCLA, with whom we won the NC2A doubles, and I, and a third person, were in a private plane flying from Los Angeles, little teeny steps, down to Rio. And when we were leaving, we were coming back, and we were going from Santa Cruz, Bolivia, to Machu Picchu, Peru. We're at 5,500 feet altitude, and all of a sudden, bang! Crank, crank, crank. The engine was blew up. The cabin filled with smoke. There was oil on the windshield. Alan shut off the engine, and there was complete silence. And I thought, I'm probably going to die. But in that instant, I said, Larry, figure out what can you possibly do to try to help get out of this thing. Alan was the pilot. I got on the radio, told the tower, hey, this is Belanca 711 Bravo Julia. We're on a heading of three, 279 degrees from the airport. We're five minutes out. Come get us. I, I'm, I won't go into the story of, of uh, how... Uh, we got out of there. But I can tell you that when that moment came, I shifted right away into the things that I learned on the tennis court, and I was able to help get us out of that. And then, of course, there's the third thing, which is my law career. You know, I've been volleying uh, with my opponents in my law cases uh, back and forth for years. I've been practicing law. I was a litigator for, for, for 55 years, I'm embarrassed to say. And uh, uh, not only did I have one case, but I had 15 cases. So I was back basically volleying with 15 different opponents, working on a game plan. I had a, a beginning thesis of my case. Then I would get new ever information and evidence, and I would have to adjust, and I have to do it with 15 different things. And then when I had a person on the witness stand, excuse me, I would cross-examine, I'd be volleying with him. And it held me in great, great, great stead. So I believe that tennis can be a springboard or it can actually be a trap. And I've explained to you how I think it can be a springboard. And this is, it can be a trap too because so many parents take their children, they put them in tennis academies, and they become pros in everything but name only, and they commit everything. And we all know that only one in a zillion make it. But what happens to all the people that don't make it? Well, a lot of them, there's littered bodies along you know, life's highways. But if people keep in mind how much there is to learn from playing tennis and what you can gain from it, um, they, 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 can, uh, they can recover and they can make a very, very, very productive life. So I, I really want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. You know, um, at my age, looking back, I realize how valuable it has been for me. And I realize how important every second is. And of course, you can't make perfect decisions all the time. That goes without saying. But once you understand that it's not working for you, whether it be in a tennis match, which you have to decide quickly, or in life, when you have more time to do it, you ask yourself this, is this the way I want to spend my life? Is this the way I want to spend my essence? And if it isn't, change and go from there. So at the end, next time you are on the tennis court, next time that you're playing either your buddy or in a championship match or watching it on television, think about some of the things that I've mentioned to you about what's really going on below and see if that doesn't make it more interesting to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.